conference. Uh, we sur survived the rain, survived the snow, survived the cold weather, the sunny morning. Uh, we have a uh, fabulous panel, an intellectually important panel, on Japanese constitutional problems. Uh, I think uh, we have been uh, discussing uh, using this German, especially the Weimar Constitution, as a, a key reference, uh, reference point. Uh, whereas, uh, for me at least, the Japanese constitutional problems uh, seem to be another extremely important reference point uh, with uh, uh, profound geopolitical, philosophical implications. So we are uh, pleased and honored to have uh, three uh, panelists. Since we have three rather than four, uh, I'll have agreed to give each uh, presenter Three more minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very, very significant. <laughs> Substantial. Uh, I suggest that uh, they still read the paper as planned and add a three minute self criticism. <laughs> so, without further ado, let's start our panel. First, uh, uh, presentation by Professor Takahiro Nakajima from University of Tokyo. Uh, advanced Institute, uh, Institute for Advanced Studies on Asia. This topic is constitutionalism and sovereignty on Japanese constitutional problems. Thank you. Thank you, Shugo. I'd like to start my talk with my self criticism. <laughs> <laughs> I am now doing uh, philosophy, especially on um, Chinese philosophy. But um, in my under much pace, I go to the faculty of law, University of Tokyo, right? And I was a former student of this gentleman, Professor Yoichi Higuchi, who is a really you know, leading scholar of constitutional theory in Japan, right? Yeah. I learned many things from Professor Higuchi, but I never imagined I talk about constitutional theory in New York. <laughs> right? So, third, over 30 years absence, I'd like to um, uh, once again focus on the uh, meaning of constitutional theory in Japan. Okay? So, <clears throat> this is um, Professor Higuchi's uh, allocation. The Constitution of Japan is none other than a declaration of human rights for Japanese society. Okay, so today I'd like to consider the relationship between constitutionalism and the sovereignty. In my undergraduate place, this term, constitutionalism, was also out of focus. It was an old fashioned notion. But uh, in recent years, <coughs> this old fashioned notion comes back again in the debate of Japanese society. Recent years <coughs> have seen the debate about the constitutional revision in Japan pushed forward by the ruling Liberal Democrat Party. Um, <coughs> the content and methods of this debate have attracted criticism from constitutionalist perspectives. Professor Hasebe, yes, of Waseda University, but he was a former uh, New Tokyo professor. Right? <clears throat> he is one of the uh, Japanese eminent theorists of constitutionalism, <clears throat> makes this remark. Yeah, I skip. According to him, constitutionalism is not, not respecting and being the constitution. The reason he gives for this is that the world abounds with constitutions whose substances are not actually constitutionalist. So it is not an issue of respecting or being a constitution. But one know how constitutionalism itself, this state power, even state power, 
based on democracy. So now we can see the sharp confrontation between democracy and the constitution as it is the current of debates in China. He refers to the ideas of Louis Enke, a former professor of international law at Columbia University. He consults Henke's distinction between consti constitutionalism and two elements. First, the sovereignty of the people and the system of representative democracy based on this. Second, the restraining of state power via the separation, checks, and balances, and respect for individual human rights. Possibly, all the same. So, this is Hassel's explanation. Here, he turns a truly ligates <coughs> on democracy. He also touches on Robert Dow, former professor of political science at Yale University, in saying that democratic politics cannot resolve problems related to the fundamentals of society. Concrete examples of this failure of democracy to keep in mind include the liberation of slaves in the United States, the question of Algerian independence of the French Fourth Republic, and the ideological clashes in the Weimar Republic. Given this, what suitable approaches might we take towards the problems that we cannot or perhaps should not try to resolve with democracy. There are multiple ethical stances crucial enough to concern issues of life and death, and whose relative merits cannot be um, <coughs> peremptorily decided. How should we best confront such issues? Possibly, he suggests that it is possible for different ethical stances to fairly coexist Justice, in the sense, may be realized, and we may opt for the way of building the framework of social life, that is, the way of constitutionalism. What then does Pasede mean by giving to the framework of social life, where it is possible for different ethical sources to feel coexist? He continues the right part. <clears throat> the other words, a constitutionalism that embodies what Hassel calls the principle of restraining state power based on the respect for human rights is one that places constraints on the state's power to impose particular means and aims on its citizens. One example where such a constraint is needed uh, concerning the issue of state power, forcing citizens to potentially die fighting an external enemy, the premise of which military conscription systems are based. We have traced <coughs> Hassel's argument to a point where several questions clearly arise. One point which requires further thought is how constitutionalism is certainly not mere relativism. State power imposes particular meanings and aims on its citizens. This is a worldwide phenomenon which was manifested in the pre-Rogenian state, and, uh, which is again vividly portrayed in the draft for, um, <coughs> draft for revising the constitution of Japan produced by LDP. Yeah, this is the <coughs> draft. Um, the constitutional thought makes criticism based on the principle of restraining state power. It doesn't simply stop at a new mutual stance, but strives to protect the modern ethical stance of respect for human rights. <coughs> Put another way, constitutionalism does not fall into the trap of empty relativism that postmodern so often uh, <coughs> succumbs to. Instead, it inherits its dimension of modern universal values critically and historically. It as follows that Hasidic, as a constitutionalist, asserts 
taught that there's no such things as a special Eastern variety of constitutionalism. The constitutionalism by which we seek to live is indeed a construct of artifice, the product of a modernity that has abund abundant distance of natural. <clears throat> this is Hasselbeck's argument of the critic of naturalism. In the debate advanced by the LDP, maintaining armed forces is seen as a natural right, as is the implementation of collective self defense. However, Hasselbeck's stance is clearly at odds with such positions. He adopts a position of moderate pacifism in which he admits the necessity of having organs of self defense, although not by military conscription. He therefore takes neither the side of the absolute pacifism nor that of devising Article 9, because both sides merely seek to assert a particular <coughs> ethical stance as a naturalistic approach and critically attempting to realize their own values in the public sphere. In contrast, taking a position of unnatural effort, in other words, to adopt a constitutionalism that incorporates critical and historical considerations would remove the need to change the current interpretation of Article 9. Um, yeah, let me skip this part. As a result, this is somehow complicated. Yeah, <clears throat> he was asked to support the uh, new law, um, 2013 Act on the Protection of Specially Designed Secrets. Right? <clears throat> he followed, he supported that act. Right? However, uh, he refused the um, um, new um, new law of <coughs> security. Yeah, so th there is a very <coughs> complicated um, situation in this constitution. <coughs> so I'd like to go in general to Okinawa's sovereignty. Constitutionalism in Japan is being tested not only by the question of Article 9, but uh, also that of Okinawa's sovereignty. Saying Okinawa's sovereignty sounds tricky, but I'd like to use this expression to consider a debate that concerns regional sovereignty and the multiplicity of sovereignties. The movement for Okinawa, a uh, version to Japan, peaked in the 1960s with the slogan of returning to the Japanese motherland under the auspices of the peace constitution. <coughs> The motivation for this movement is suggested by the vague concept of residual sovereignty. That is to say, despite the legal fiction that the country of Japan had residual sovereignty over Okinawa, the fact remained that Okinawa was a territory which could neither be adequately covered by the jurisdiction of the Constitution of Japan, nor that of the Constitution of the United States. The movement for reversion thus saw the restoration of provisions for human rights and the realization of an iron without military basis in keeping with the spirit of Japan's peace constitution. However, even after Okinawa reverted to the Japanese Union in 1972, its burden of military bases remained exceedingly large, and the situation of most neglect with regard to human rights also persisted. In the midst of the debate on the constitutional revision, the following critic emerged from Okinawa. Yeah. If you want to abandon the constitution of Japan, please give it to the people of Okinawa. Yeah, this <coughs> has a somehow, somehow the echo of Takeo Kyushu, probably much more talk about. 
Okinawa you know, will become independent along with the constitution of Japan. Such calls for Okinawa you know, independence have heightened in recent years. One of the theoretical views of this position is found in the draft constitution authored by Kamamitsu Shinichi in 1981, titled C, Personal Draft Constitution of the Republican Society of Nova State, Republican Society of Ryukyu. This is its preface. Here, I wish to call your attention to how Kawamitsu uses the concept of a Republican society of Ryukyu. This concept does not take the premise of a state in the sense of a nation state. Instead, it is a social constitution which places the sovereignty of self governing communities as at its core. Following Kawamitsu's proposal, many other plans for Okinawa independence were proposed, and which were strongly criticized by proponents of nationalism. Very harsh criticism. Here, I'd like to consider this issue from the viewpoints of constitutionalism and sovereignty. <clears throat> Nakazato said that at some point, the time will come when the lasted concept special law for local referendum contained in Chapter 8, Article 95 of the Constitution of Japan is deployed in Okinawa. So what does he mean? So this is Article 95. Okay. Yeah, it's for the local referendum. When the uh, <coughs> huge uh, problems uh, arise in the local community from the government, Article 95 has garnered much scrutiny thanks to the theoretical insights of Kimura Sota, Professor Gong, and Tokyo Metropolitan University, who introduced a new perspective by a constitutional interpretation into the debate over moving this argument basis to him. His argument, in essence, revolves about this Article 95. So I skip some parts. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is due to how even if this nation is democratically enacted in the diet, the issue would still require a referendum carried out by the people of Okinawa, as stipulated in this Article 95, in order to be fully constitutional or uh, constitutional. In the background to this debate, as with Hassel's arguments earlier described, there is an extremely light perspective of the working of democracy. <coughs> Kim Rasun now. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is Kim Rasun's um, <coughs> explanation. Okay, so in my view, this state of affairs arises from the question of Okinawa's sovereignty. If Kimura's um, three article framework was enacted and the popular will of Okinawa decided against the construction of basis, what will happen? Since the US military basis concern the most critical issues of our diplomacy and security, national sovereignty will be harmed by regional sovereignty. Furthermore, insofar as the debate on Kinawa independence broadly includes proposals like Kawamitsu's draft uh, constitution, are you for abandoning the state and even establishing an independent Okinawa Republic? It is clear that it challenges the sovereignty of the Japanese state. Thus, we now arrive at the question of the division of sharing of sovereignty, how it harsh of sovereignty in the set of means with regards to constitutional means as viewed from the issue of military basis.
this juncture, let us review the notion of the sovereignty of the people. It goes without saying that it differs from state sovereignty, but it is also distinct from national sovereignty. National sovereignty assumes that people are constituted as a nation. Um, <clears throat> that is, it assumes they are national so sovereigns who choose their own representatives and who consent to be <clears throat> by said representatives. The exercise of sovereignty is limited to the election of representatives. Our representatives who are not bound by their electorate and who govern according to their own inclinations. As a result, national sovereignty creates a dissociation between the sovereign nation and the representative agents, which create the potential for it, for it to become undemocratic. In contrast, sovereignty of the people proposes that all people are perfectly equal in political standing and that they themselves are not governed as sovereigns. And all, even if a system of representation is implemented, the elected representatives will be are expected to act according to the wishes of their electorate and will face expansion if they go against those wishes. The Constitution of Japan mixes these two senses of national security and the sovereignty of the people, but in fact is applied according to a form of national security. Returning to the issue of arbitrage, the division and sharing of sovereignty, we see that there are multiple ways in which, based on the sovereignty of the people, a governing entity could be formed. Such an entity could arise from the division of sovereignty amongst the states and the federation, or it could derive from the authority of an international union <coughs> that are surrounded by the nation. It can also be composed of local sovereignties, which are smaller in scale which could also be gathered into a broader transnational. Okinawa is now attempting to question the problem which touches on this very sense of the sovereignty of the people, of the harsh and of the sovereignty. Yet this attempt raises the question of how our current democracy has avoided questioning that problem. If we accept Jack Derrida's place, that democracy to come we will raise questions about the sovereignty of the people and the division and sharing of sovereignty. We will surely achieve a deeper balancing of surfaces in the debate on constitutionalism. I'd like to end up by repeating the quote that began this paper from Professor Higuchi. Um, the Constitution of Japan is now more than a declaration of human rights for Japanese. <coughs> Constitutionalism of Japan has depends on how it can deepen this declaration of human rights, which is called cool, the Constitution of Japan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nakajima. Uh, wonderful speaker. Our second presenter is uh, Tim Wong from Peking University. His uh, title is For the Vestibules. I, I hope I pronounced this word correctly. Constitution, a political philosophical reading of arts and not of the Japanese Constitution. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> first, I have to apologize that instead of giving a direct interpretation of Article 9 of Japanese Constitution, I'm mainly focus on a Japanese thinker whose name is Takeo Yoshimi. I don't know if you know about this guy, but he's fabulous. So after my presentation, I hope that you could have a little bit, uh, if not knowledge, then a little bit information about his thinking um, constitution. Yes, after the promulgation of the so-called Peaceful Constitution of Japan, Takeshi Yoshimi wrote an essay entitled Our Feeling for the Constitution, where he critically examines the emotional distance between the constitution and the Japanese people. He wrote, the new constitution is something remote from us. Now we have these universal principles of humanity that are beautifully written in the constitution. For all its beautifulness, however, it seems too shining to be our own. I think that the same holds true for the soldiers who engaged in that war. Dying while shouting out long life, 
the emperor. Admittedly, new education makes us faithful to the emperor. Yet these soldiers only borrow this form to express their wishes for freedom. For lack of other means, they had to borrow this distorted form. It's a very tricky examination of the constitution and a very weird critique of it. The claim that the Japanese have to express their wishes for freedom through distorted forms concerns, I think, Takeuchi understanding of what the constitution appeals to, namely these very systems and principles that directly borrow from modern Western democracies. More generally, this claim, I think, has to do with Takeuchi's own understanding of the relationship between the so-called universal principles of humanity on one hand and the subjectivity of Japan and of Asia in general on the other. Which means, without understanding Takeuchi's analysis of the historical establishment of the modern value system, without reading his critique on modernity in general, we can hardly understand the radicality of his critique of the Constitution. So in what follows, I will read uh, his famous essay, What is Modernity, through which I think uh, Takeuchi's critique of the Constitution is highly associated with his argument about the relationship between literature and politics. Namely, literature finds its proper place in Takeuchi's style. Only where all given political articulations and uh, programs become inoperative, a place without place, a place that is only virtually indirectly configured. Takeuchi's critique of the Constitution in this very sense eventually leads to what he calls the connection of the weak. These are now these are simply mysterious terms. Uh, <clears throat> in what is modernity, Takeuchi starts with a foundational or fundamental question, namely, what is the oriental modernity? It, argues him, is the result of the coercion of the euro, or derived from the coercion of the euro. Although we may retroactively recognize characteristics in pre-modern societies as elements for the development of modernity, the very willingness or stimulus to take such a retroactive step cannot do without the so-called invasion of the euro. Takeuchi crucial, crucially argues that what underlies the European invasion has nothing to do with any program in social fields, rather it is the spirit of self-expansion. He writes, quote, modernity is the self-recognition of Europe as seen within history. The regarding of itself as distinct from the feudalistic which Europe gained in the process of liberating itself from the feudal. Therefore, it can be said that Europe is the first possible only in this history, and that history itself is possible only in this Europe." End quote. Far from being a particular one-time event in history, the European invasion of Asia is the decisive event that determines history and makes history itself possible. After defining the secondary nature of the Oriental modernity, Takeuchi writes on the Europe per se. He says, quote unquote, simply being Europe does not make Europe Europe. No matter what the motivation of the invasion of Orient is, Europe is always in the movement of willing to become itself, a movement that makes it impossible to stop at the status quo. Europe is what it is only because it ceaselessly loses itself and embraces what is other than itself. This is kind of Hegelian dialectical self-negation by self-development. <clears throat> Moreover, in political terms, not emphasize the term in political terms, even the resistance of Asia, so well, the, the resistance, that term is Takeuchi's most famous term in his thinking. A crucial concept that has been repeatedly <coughs> discussed in Japan as well as in China when people talk about Takeuchi. The resistance of Asia is resulted from the dialectical self-unfolding of the European history. He writes, quote unquote, the European invasion of the <coughs> Orient produces resistance there, a resistance that was, of course, reflected in Europe itself. Yet even this could not change the thoroughgoing rationalist conviction that all things can ultimately be objectified and extracted in Europe. 
resistance was calculated, and it, it was clear that through the through resistance, Asia was destined to increasingly Europeanize itself. Thus, the division between the European modernity and the Oriental modernity modernity does not lie in the contrast between reason and resistance, if only because the Oriental resistance is always already politically reduced to an indispensable element for the European dialect dialectics of self-expansion. It is not only produced by the European invasion, but also assimilated into the self-determinative history of the Europe in a negative theological way. He writes, quote, it was through the Orient's resistance that Europe recognized its own triumph in the cause of comprehending the, the uh, Orient within world history. This triumph was conceived in terms of cultural, ethnic, national, and economic superiority. The Orient <coughs> recognized its defeat within this same process. End quote. The resistance of Asia, together with the process of modernization, cannot not politically belong to the European modernity. The modernization of Asia is nothing but the Europeanization of Asia. Modernity is European modernity. History is European history. Everything belongs to the Europe. By saying so, Takeuchi refuses the possibility of Asia's self-understanding. He says something, something like, Asia countries cannot self themselves. They can only self themselves by appropriating these tools, concepts, frameworks produced by the Western mind. That's, that's highly yeah. controversial and uh, radical, right? Uh, <clears throat> if Europe is represented by the notion of reason, then this is also technology. Both reason and, and non-reason, i.e. nature, both reason and non-reason would be European. Europe, everything belongs to Europe. This is own world. Asia is, after everything is said and done, Asia is only a virtual image reflected by the European substance, which embodies itself concretely in history through constant self-unfolding and self-negation. But I think we can grasp this, the significance of this virtual image in at least two senses. First, as a virtual image, Asia in itself cannot substantially produce its own image because even its image of retreat and failure is determined by Europe beforehand. Secondly, more important, as non-substantial, this so-called virtual image leads to an unstable element that, that can hardly be grasped by the European spirit. Takuchi writes, quote, unquote, Oriental resistance were reflect, reflected in Europe. Nothing can escape Europe's eye insofar as it exists within the framework of modernity. At each crisis in which Europe, <coughs> Europe becomes conscious of its own, uh, own internal contradictions, those things that rise to the surface of its consciousness are always recollections of the Orient that exists latently within it. Europe's nostalgia for the Orient is one of its contradictions, and it is forced to think this Orient the more explicit these contradictions become. On one hand, the constant resistance of Asia is politically within Europe, in that without the European invasion of Asia, there will be no Asian resistance. But on the other hand, the Asian resistance is also outside of Europe, in the very sense in which Asia can never be completely assimilated and tamed, for the self-justification of Europe <coughs> is based upon its assimilation of Asia as its other, the next sense. All right. where its imagination of Asia has to be constantly reproduced. It's, it's kind of post-colonial theory ABC. You have to reproduce constantly your other in order to finish and continue the process of self-negation and self-unfolding. <coughs> now, nothing new here, but something surprising happens when Takeuchi continues. With regard to this paradoxical resistance, this element that is simultaneously within and without Europe, Takeuchi confesses <coughs> by saying that, quote unquote, I know not what resistance is. I cannot engage in examining the meaning of resistance. I'm not good at philosophical thinking. I can only feel that there's something there. 
but I cannot extract it for a theoretical construction. I cannot do that, not because it is impossible, but because I am powerless. In the last analysis, I know not whether this is possible. <laughs> now, I want to emphasize the term powerlessness here, because for Takeuchi, powerlessness does not mean inability. On the contrary, the position of powerlessness is exactly, for him, the position of literature. In his famous work on Lu Xun, a Chinese writer, Takeuchi writes on the relationship between literature and politics. Quote, literature is powerless. Powerless, <coughs> powerlessness refers to the powerlessness of literature towards <coughs> politics. That is, what is powerful towards politics is not literary. The powerlessness of literature towards politics is due to the fact that literature as such alienates politics while engaging with it. End quote. The powerlessness of literature is a refusal of the European reason and political programming. The Asian resistance gives birth to a literary subjectivity that is only powerless in contradistinction to the self-unfolding, self-negating, self-developing Hegelian subjectivity that is powerful. In political terms, then, why does this powerless subjectivity and powerlessness matter? The answer is, according to Takeuchi, connection or connectedness. In a note of travel written in 1942, Takeuchi talks about his experience of reading uh, Nakao Shikeharu. He says, quote unquote, the powerlessness is as follows. Through reading one's own powerlessness, one utterly becomes being itself, whereby one lives in the heart of the other. Literature, I believe, is exactly something like this. Literature is such an action, namely through becoming nothing, it influences the other's fire. First, literature is by nature different from political resistance. For uh, Nakao's work is written when the author gives up any hope on political resistance. Literary resistance, for all its powerlessness, establishes a non-dialectical, non-substantial, and non-theorizable connection between the self and the other. Second, this connectedness of connection is related to Takeuchi's understanding of Asia. Because <coughs> from a geopolitical concept, Asia, in Takeuchi's thought, signifies the suppressed and the weak. Takeuchi writes, quote unquote, this is in an essay called Asian Nationalism. In order to get rid of the suppressive imperialism, Asia only has two methods, either to become imperialist as well, or to execute imperialism out of the war. In Asian countries, Japan chose the first, while many other countries, including China, chose the second. It's a method of nationalism characteristic of the connection of the weak, rather than an exclusive nationalism. The confrontation between literature and European politics keeps the connection of the weak from any political logic of identification. Asia is not a geopolitical concept, for it is nothing other than a name for this connection that is always non-identical. As Naoki Sakai writes, quote unquote, resistance in Takeuchi Yoshimi cannot form the structure of identity of the subject. In other words, if negation is determinative of the subject through opposing the negative term, then resistance is not negation. Rather, it is close to negativity that is explicitly distinguished from negation. Now let's come back to uh, Takeuchi's critique of the Japanese constitution. Positively establishing a value system as universal, the constitution is non-literary. Of course, it's a non-literary, but what does it mean? Non-literary in the sense that the constitution deeply involves Japan in the process of self-Europeanization, -Europe so that Japan would become one particular moment in the world history determined by the European modernity. Non-literary in the sense that Japan loses the Asian perspective, unable to confront its invasion of Asian countries, unable to think of alternatives to capitalism from the position of the connection of the weak, 
a, a position without position, a position that is non-localizable and non-identical. In this sense, to subject uh, to subjectify itself means for Takeuchi to posit a literary position of nothingness, which does not usher in a more comprehensive, more powerful subject, but a connection <coughs> with the weak, a connection that is not politically programmable. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Monty. Um, our third speaker is Warren Kuzman from Yonsei University in Korea. His topic is Poetic Inquisitions, Japanese-U.S. Constitutional Problems of Peace and Tranquility. <laughs> As Garrett Epps declares in his 2013 constitutional study, Poetry of the Preamble, while the phrase, we the people of the United States, is etched deep in the national consciousness, the people were not involved in its composition. Epps argues that those who wrote it speak to the people in their own voice so effectively that they have come to believe it issued from rather than being all but imposed upon them. One wonders to what extent this holds true for the Japanese people, whose peace constitution, 1946, composed by General MacArthur's military staff during the U.S. occupation, employs the same we, the people, language in its preamble. In examining the U.S. Constitution as a poetic text, Epps also applies Charles Olson's definition of poetry as, feel, as a field of energy transfer from where the poet got it by way of the poem itself to the reader. A high energy construct and at all points an energy discharge. The electrical metaphor recalls another useful definition of poetry, Ezra Pound's as charged language capable of transmitting shock. It is difficult to imagine a shock of textual energy transfer greater than the one that occurred on February 13, 1946, when General Whitney, acting under MacArthur's order, informed Minister Matsumoto Joji his constitutional draft revision, being insufficiently democratic, had been rejected in favor of a U.S. government section version drafted over the course of one week by a team of 24. Such shock compounded by the ultimatum that this was his cabinet's last chance to save the emperor and remain in power. If they did not accept it by February 20th, Whitney threatened to deliver it directly to the Japanese people. Adding ventriloquistic insult to injury, the Japanese not only had to accept this foreign constitution, they were required to defend its legitimacy by maintaining the fiction that they had authored it themselves. Considering the history of the constitutionally commandeered voices of the Japanese people, I wish to explore their peace constitution as a poetic text with some attention to how it is read and what it means to the people who continue to live under it, to see how contemporary Japanese people in their own voices make sense of it. In considering the formalist elements of poetry such as rhyme and meter as primarily mnemonic pedagogical devices, one might also liken the temporal duress of the deadline to meter as a formal characteristic of text based on time. In this respect, MacArthur's time constraint had a monumental unintended effect in democratizing politics in Japan. Prior to the 1946 constitution, all legal documents were composed in bungotai, a classic Japanese text inaccessible to the majority of the people. Because the cabinet was not able to translate the GS draft into Bungo Tai in the allotted time, they wrote it in colloquial Japanese. This set a new precedent. All government documents from then on were written in Kobo Tai, colloquial Japanese. The thrice repeated 
invocation, we, the Japanese people, in the, in the 1946 preamble, serves to establish an aphora, infusing the piece with a song-like, prayer-like quality that goes beyond that of the 1789 template. But whose prayer? In some ways, it feels like that of the American composers, a prayer that they would never again be confronted by such a formidable enemy. Read sympathetically, the preamble, with its commitment to preserve our security and existence through trusting in the faith of the peace-loving peoples of the world, is incredibly idealistic. Read critically, it is patronizing, vindictive, oppositional. The first draft reveals such sentiments in its detailed condemnations and impossible project of enforcing not just domestic, but total international peace. Uh, it said originally, the blessings of liberty throughout this land and republic. Oh, uh, we secure for ourselves and our posterity the fruits of peaceful cooperation with all nations and the blessings of liberty throughout this land and resolve that never again shall this nation or any other nation be visited with the horrors of war through the, er through the arrogance of irresponsible officials or the greed for power of entrenched wealth and position. Coupled with phrases like, so they made it much more objective, Coupled with phrases like, we desire to occupy an emphasis on obedience, it resembles an inversion of the thwarted imperial project, an endless reminder of defeat. In this light, we the Japanese people sounds less like an empowering refrain and more like a conceit of the GHQ as a religious colonizer forced into the mouths of the defeated in catechistic fashion in order to penetrate, if not via explanation, through sheer force of repetition. Nothing quite captures the oppositional exchanges of the text, as well as the parody, as well as the parody produced by the Smash the Security Treaty organization on the, in the red, and the, uh, the real one is on the left. <laughs> that said, uh, the pedagogical tone could also be seen as self-directed. GS staff admitted their project began as an academic exercise, the function of having to convince themselves they were up to the daunting task of composing a constitution in a week. Perhaps the most mysterious thing about the we the Japanese people lyric is that the we the first person plural that accounts for most of its music and Vatic performativity, the most poetic element of the anaphoric arrangement, is eliminated from the Japanese text. Without it, it operates in the third person, such that one does not know who is talking or who is being addressed. So it's just a, yeah, third, it sounds like third person, you don't quote me much, it doesn't say why they, but the first person is, uh, oh, it's not likely the result of pronoun omission, as the first person plural appears repeatedly throughout the body of the text. Whether an oversight in translation and retranslation, the pairing away of an unfamiliar <coughs> illusion or an act of resistance in rejection of an alien American voice, informant H suggests the Japanese voice requires a different song. Quote, I think that Japanese people, protected by the peace constitution and the U.S. military, are to some extent the naive beneficiaries of an artificial state of peace. You must protect peace with your own hands. You can't leave it to others. It is regrettable that after the war, education to protect the country has not been enacted. At elementary schools in the United States, kids put their hands to their chests every morning. The words, for our country, must be sung. That, this is a point that is lacking in Japanese education. The Constitution changed everything. I feel we must preserve our Constitution no matter what. It emphasizes peace and nothing but peace. 150 years ago, the modern J Japan started by adapting, not adopting Western ways. So this is from a, a different, uh, I'm sorry. Sense. Through, though the music may be lost, informant A sincerely embraces the heroic qualities of the text. 
The Constitution changed everything. I feel we must preserve our Constitution no matter what. It emphasizes peace and nothing but peace. 150 years ago, modern Japan started by adapting, not adopting, Western ways. So why not embrace the US-made Constitution as long as it's a good thing? Informant C takes a similar approach, expressing pride in the capacity for adaptation. A mentions as a unique Japanese ability. We Japanese have a long history of utilizing foreign things. For example, we have learned uh, from China and imported a lot of things like Chinese characters or Buddhism. So we don't <coughs> mind importing even our constitution. It is if it is a practical and useful. In fact, it was useful in the Cold War. It allowed Japan to develop its economy without using much military costs. Whether it was written by you or by others, you better accept its good aspects. This is one of our Japanese virtues. While there is a sense of resignation in informant A's orientation, quote, I oppose amendment, but after all, we have no choice but to be protected by the US. Informant C expresses an imperturbable resilience and positivity. Quote, we unconsciously interpreted being forced as being chosen. Both A's and C's comments resonate with Masao Murayama's concept of aso astinato, the notion that Japanese culture is a kind of universally accommodating baseline able to bend any foreign melody to its own societal, societal harmony. Wary of fetishizing Japanese singularity, informant D adds some interesting nuances. Quote, the notion of constitution is a product of enlightenment. As a civilization that does not belong to the origin of enlightenment, any law that we pass will be an adaptation or variation of the original, and that is fine. A constitution is not a means to express people's sentiment, to express they are fundamentally unique. Informant E voices a radically different pedagogical mythology. Japan, quote, Japan's colonial policy was fundamentally different from that of the West. Western colonial policy enslaved indigenous peoples. Japan educated indigenous peoples and treated them like Japanese. Also, the contents of the 1946 Constitution were composed simply to prevent Japan from competing with or opposing the West. They just brainwashed Japan and education, with education and history convenient to the purposes of the West. It's Japan's fault. What they did was terrible. It is sad how China and the <coughs> Korean Peninsula have also been made to believe in these lies, and this fabricated history is now thought of as the truth. The only meaning of peace in the current constitution is that Japan cannot oppose the West. It is not a real peace constitution for Japan. Not quite as skeptical, informant B takes pleasure in two features of the forced 1946 constitution, which go beyond those of the United States. Quote, I am glad that the Japanese did not write the constitution. Otherwise, not only Article 9, the renunciation of war, but also Article 24, providing for gender equality, would never have been included. I also find some irony in the imposed constitution because Article 9 indicates an ideal that even Americans cannot live up to. Apart from, sonic, apart from the sonic and mnemonic formal elements, poetry and the 1946 constitution share another defining characteristic, ambiguity. Both are carefully constructed for ambiguity. In many cases, ambiguity was introduced by the Japanese through translation their primary mechanism for navigating and resisting GS demands. Though subtle, and sometimes not so subtle, the first Japanese version of the GS Constitution was completely cut, completely cut out the preamble. Shifts in terminology, the Japanese were able to subvert and substantially alter constitutional content. As Mark Yakich states in Poetry of Survivor's Guide, the primary intent of poems is to discomfort sensible thinking in order to provide an alternative sense. Poetry works through juxtaposition, providing space where two opposing concepts can be held in the mind simultaneously without having to reach for either one. This is Keats' negative capability. Poetic ambiguity manifests in paradox, cognitive dissonance, oxymoron, aporia, difference, all ways of difference, all ways of putting the reader in an ostensibly uncomfortable position. This kind of discomfort is evident in informant East argument for amendment. Quote, the meaning of SDF, self-defense force, and army are different. If the army makes a judgment that the enemy is going to attack, we can launch a preemptive attack. The SDF cannot fight back until it is attacked. A self-defense force cannot take action until it is being attacked. 
Don't you think it's a little too late to think about taking action after your territory has already been invaded? <laughs> One would be hard pressed to find an instance of constitutional ambiguity more evident than that of the cognitive dissonance surrounding the paradox of Article 9's theoretical renunciation of war and Japan's real world maintenance of the, and deployment of military forces. Because this, perhaps this is due to the fact that both sides had an interest in making Article 9 ambiguous. Informants B's mixed feelings well capture this sense of ambiguity. I have mixed feelings toward the peace stressed in the Constitution. The peace in post-war Japan has been maintained by the post-1945 Gisei sacrifice of neighboring American-led regimes backed by dictatorships and war for decades, South Korea, Taiwan, Okinawa. At the same time, raised by parents who had opposed the 1960 U.S.-Japan Security Treaty and then provided their children with the comfort of liberal middle caste lifestyle, I am the very product of post-war Japan and its peace constitution, and until recently tended to take peace, democracy, and prosperity for granted. In embracing defeat, John Dower provides an important example of resistance achieved through translation involving the choice of a term for the people. By replacing the term Jinmin, the term used to translate the people in the Gettysburg Address, which has some socialist or communist connotations that were anathema to the reactionary cabinet, with kokumin, literally country people, connoting a harmonious, harmonious relationship between the people and the state, the cabinet was able to exclude non-Japanese citizen residents, such as the descendants of Korean forced laborers and other minority groups from the protections of human rights, the injustice of which Informant B only recently became aware, quote, recently through conversations with dissident Okinawans and Zainichi and South Koreans, I came to view how deceptive the concept of Japan as a peaceful nation was. Uh, while Beata Sirota, one of only four women on the drafting team, was, and the one responsible for the article about equality of gender, insisted, we never felt as though we were teaching the Japanese it is difficult to deny the pedagogical thrust of the 1946 Constitution in affecting MacArthur's three principles, maintaining the emperor, renouncing war, and eliminating feudalism. His staff composed the new Constitution to inculcate democracy, popular sovereignty, human rights, and its anticipation of the imminent war crimes tribunals, universal law, to which state sovereignty is subordinate. The revolutionary nature of the peace constitution is expressed singly and ingeniously in these educational before and after posters, which I'm not going I won't talk about too much, but you can see uh, in the first frame, so uh, there's the people bow down and venerate the official with an offering. In the second, the positions are reversed. The official is depicted as a public servant, occupying a physically lower position than the people. And the gestures of pointing are quite different, subservient in the first and directed in the second. And in the third and fourth, uh, you see the relative worth or significance of the emperor, nobility, male and female people expressed through physical size and a platform boosting each other in descending order. In the fourth panel, the platforms that convey privilege are removed by the vehicle the literal vehicle of the that says constitution on the side of the truck. And, uh, and each member of society is equal size, status, and significance. So what I find so funny about this is that uh, it's, a, you know, the nobility, the second from the left, is still there, just the word nobility has been crossed out. <laughs> this still has a nice closing. <laughs> supposed to get rid of period. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and here, um, the five and six, the army and navy generals hold court over the cabinet members from an elevated position. They face each other oppositionally. It's a one-way address. The facial expressions of the cabinet members are disgruntled, hands on hips. But in panel six, the military has been replaced by flowers. <laughs> cabinet members sit around the table with a variety of expressions, some smiling, some serious, but none angry. In seven, it expresses the imbalance of patriarchy in the household. All power emanates from the father. One controls the property, two decides who his children will marry, three handles all public matters, four dominates his wife. But in eight, the wife and the husband marry out of mutual agreement, 
are equal in addressing public matters and discuss everything and decide together. And you can see that husband looks much happier. <laughs> <laughs> With listening to informant E, one can only imagine the difficulties of rapid adjustment to such comprehensive social changes. The, they are prob quote, there probably aren't any people in the world who know the frustrations of the peace constitution as much as the Japanese. However, I think that today's education lacks or fails to instill the consciousness of protecting your own country by yourself. My grandmother was the daughter of a samurai. I grew up with my grandfather and uncle in an officer's house, so I am familiar with the meaning of dedicating my life to the country. In my grandfather's generation, we fought with the United States, but my whole family loved America, and we still like it. As Epps, in conclusion, as Epps equates the drafters of the US Constitution to speak to the people in their own voice with Calliope, not the poet who tells the tale of Hector and Achilles, it remains to be seen whether the American literary agents of the Japanese Constitution were poets, muses, or simply vehicles for some other spirit of history. Muses or not, Americans who were once loved and now just loved. <laughs> So we have almost all of 30 minutes for discussion. Any questions? One, two, three. Yeah, I, 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 I'm very interested. Uh, Joanne and I went to a 70th anniversary Hiroshima bombing uh, conference in August. I opening, uh, was opening to 12 featured speakers there. And when we came back, there was a rally against the change in the peace constitution, which we unfortunately missed because we had to get our flight. Uh, but when we got back in Tokyo that, that day, that was in August of 2015. But uh, yesterday when I made my presentation on Reporters Without Borders, the G7 countries, Japan used to be at the top with, uh, with uh, uh, Canada, and Germany, you know, it used to be the top three, and, and we were like 10th, 16th, and Japan was 22nd back in 2012. In 2017, it dropped to number 72. Uh, militarism tends to pull you down. The, uh, the other ones that towards the bottom are the militaristic three in, in, uh, in uh, NATO, uh, Britain, the, uh, to France and the United States that are, the, are sort of in the 40s, and uh, only Berlusconi in Italy did worse <laughs> because he owns the press. But uh, uh, Japan fell out of grace uh, from 22nd in the world to 72nd in the world over that period. And I presume it's because of the struggles with the peace constitution that are going on in Japan. The uh, well, so is, is that true? Uh, what's your experience of, of the press in Japan? Uh, uh, is 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 there a lot of manipulation uh, going on by the president, president, or or the uh, whatever in trying to change the constitution? That's uh, uh, creating difficulties in Japan. Uh, apparently, that seems to be the theme of the whole discussion. And I just ask. How true is that in terms of the press? <coughs> so there have been much of debates on the peace constitution. Moving our party, LDP, the Democratic Party, has its own, you know, original idea uh, in which we have to divide this peace. Original, right? Yeah, but um, <coughs> right now the Prime Minister Abe shows us some new direction of the revision of the Constitution. Uh, that is, we just um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> just to uh, put the you know <coughs> uh, the third. Uh, <coughs> 
third root optical, not the third part for the uh, optical line. <coughs> In order to um, <coughs> light down the defense uh, <coughs> defense force as a national uh, so <coughs> but now um, yeah we are thinking of all the debate on this constitution <coughs> is somehow showing right yeah so <coughs> it has not it, 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 it doesn't have a you know theoretical or constitutional uh, <coughs> you know uh, principle debate on peace constitution it is now narrowly uh, <coughs> shrinked right but the uh, people in Hiroshima <coughs> totally disagree with this direction of revision. So in the so Japanese society, there is a very um, harsh tension between the division of the constitution and the protection of the constitution. I don't know much about the press, but on uh, as Professor Nakajima mentioned, the, uh, I think Abe's uh, goal now is to see in the in the Article Nine it says uh, that no that uh, Japan will maintain no military, air, sea, or land forces. Uh, but there was it was always there was no ruling of law by the Supreme Court. Kenneth Port makes a big a point about this that it was always just. Interpret, interpret it to mean there is that they can have defense because the the second paragraph is like is subordinate uh, to the first. So it it uh, they interpret it to mean that no military forces can be used to attack another country, but they would have the right of defense. So um, what Abe wants to do is actually put language as the third par par yeah. part that says. To write it in that we can have a self-defense force, it's not in there. Right? It's just been interpreted that way, which is I, I I'm not sure why it's why he wants to do that actually. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I remember the, 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 this this religion causes a sort of translation problem in in in, in China because it's now translated as something like uh, um, group fighting rights, namely Japan, even though it could not uh, attack another country uh, uh, all by itself, it could join presumably US-led military intervention by sending troops overseas. So China reads in this sort of as something very slippery, so no, no, no. But I think that was already, le that was legislated in 2015. Oh, that's an older debate. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 but no, it's, no, it's, it's, it's not there. It's not, it's not, not no. legally returned as, as a right. But uh, no, I, I, I don't want to kind of intervene, but I just want to add one very little thing. Uh, uh, class two of Article 9 uh, is something like as follows. I have it here. <laughs> <laughs> In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, See that's the, the controversial part. Mm -hmm. So you can you can have in different interpretations of the first clause, but then uh, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential. So everything is included here. You have potentiality for war itself. The war, the potentiality of war itself is kind of excluded as a possibility, and then will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. This is very, very weird. Since since after World War II, no nation state has the right of waging war against another state. It's not a kind of legal right. No nation state on earth has that the, the right of belligerency of the state. Okay, let's let's uh uh let's uh leave it here and we can come back to this issue. Yeah, thanks for this uh, really um, thought-provoking panel. What I learned is that uh, the notion of constitution is itself uh, uh, slippery. Uh, uh, constitution it can, have, it can have a descriptive character. We the people are exist, and the constitution expresses that. 
or the Constitution is performative and expresses aspirations. We the people in order to. So I think that generates ambiguity necessarily in any constitutional document, not just the Japanese Constitution. The United States Constitution, the tension between the Articles and the, uh, the, the Bill of Rights, I think this, this is the center of constitutional law today, all that, or the issue of slavery, absolutely ambiguous in the, in the Constitution. Which brings me back to uh, Professor Nakajima's uh, quotation from um, uh, Higuchi, uh, the Constitution of Japan is nothing more than a declaration of human rights for Japanese society. What on earth does that mean? <laughs> does that mean that the, this Constitution gives human rights as, as up here? Or does that mean that this Constitution imposes um, uh, exogenous documents, right? either from the French Revolution or from the United Nations, onto Japan in a kind of benevolent, quote unquote, imperialist manner. What, what does he mean by that? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Professor Higuchi um, <clears throat> tries to think of the legitimacy of this current uh, constitution of Japan. But, you know, <clears throat> legitimizes Japanese constitution. And, uh, he tries to uh, adopt the French Revolution image. Oh, we the people, we the people have the constitutional power to you know, launch the new constitution. There was a kind of revolution between the pre-war period and the uh, post-war period. So we have the new constitution <coughs> driving for the revolutionary power, constitutional power from the people. That is the basement of those images of the thinking of the legitimacy of the constitution. That is why he intentionally refers to the you know, French type of uh, declaration of human rights in the uh, <coughs> constitution of Japan. But <coughs> as Logan says, it's a really you know, ambitious, performative you know, interpretation of the constitution of Japan. So that's why, like Karl Professor Hasebe, he does not follow this direction at all. Right? He cannot admit the any sort of constitutional power. No, there's no such you know mythical power to legitimize the constitution. No constitution is just um, how to say inheritance of the Former uh, constitutions evolving in uh, Japanese pre war constitution and also other you know, constitutions in international law. So there is a very sharp distinction uh, of the images to the uh, legitimacy of the constitution. That is why the uh, confrontation between uh, democracy and the constitution is. Is a um, new way of interpretation of the legitimacy of the Constitution. I, was, I also thought about this. Uh, I, I was wondering whether this human rights specifically uh, points to the direction of popular sovereignty in order to exclude the emperor, uh, the militaristic state, and all these, some of the you know, these uh, uh, layers, and uh, to form some kind of immediacy that we are. I was just wondering. I was, yeah. You know, otherwise, this language is quite strange. If I could just follow up. 1945, 46, 47 in Japan. Um, is this was this was this constitution experienced as imperialist imposition? Was there no domestic uh, democratic uh, sentiment in the population? I'm thinking of this analogous to Germany in 1919, where there was. Uh, also, arguments that this was an imposed constitution on, uh, from the West, but at the same time, enormous democratic sentiments and uh, hostile to the emperor, to the Kaiser. Yeah, there were some, you know, some challenges to write down a new constitution after 1945, right? Yeah, maybe the, 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 those attempts were coming from the uh, you know, popular. 
love, okay, and uh, focus a huge reliance on the uh, theme of Miyazawa Toshiyoshi, right, <coughs> who also uh, wrote down a one more, you know, possible uh, image of constitution with Mariyama Masa, right. So it shows, but, but, it, it, but this is not a radical, right. That's why Professor Higuchi tried to reinterpret this, you know, <coughs> challenge in his own way. So that's why in the first lecture, uh, I remember it, in the first lecture of the Japanese constitution, he proposed us, hey guys, we have to distinguish two different notions. One is uh, sovereignty of the people, another is sovereignty of the nation. That is completely different. So we have to rely on the sovereignty of the people instead of sovereignty of the nation. So Japanese constitution can show this direction. So that is the first lecture. Yeah. Um, more of an observation and a light part of observation for for Lord. But um, I, I was just thinking about uh, your discussion about uh, whether it's necessary to add language uh, about uh, self defense or along those lines. And uh, I was thinking about Hiroshi Kurosawa's recent movie before we vanish. And um, there is a totally different attitude, and I think the debate is must be. A, cultural debate in, in Japan, we can change the minds of our aggressor. So we don't really need to defend ourselves because we can change their minds before they attack us. So I was wondering, what about that? Well, that makes me think of, 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 of Dr. Wong, you were talking about this, uh, the, the sense of uh, literature as picking up where politics leaves yeah. off, or exactly. um, also, I guess, uh, one of the people who was instrumental, it's not in the Constitution, but they had this thing called the Declaration of Humanity of the Emperor. So the Constitution was designed, uh, was um, it, it, the new, the Peace Constitution was um, uh, changing something that was established in the 1889 Meiji Constitution, which was based on the Prussian uh, Constitution, a uh, constitutional monarchy to popular sovereignty. So they wanted to retain the, the emperor, uh, but as uh, all this power has to come come from the people, the way it's written, the emperor derives his power from the people. Right? So, uh, oh, that's <laughs> uh, oh, but uh, so one of the people who uh, wrote that was, it also wasn't written by the Japanese, it was written by R.H. Brock Bly, this British, uh, poet and translator of haiku and uh, famously when the emperor <clears throat> made publicly announced that he was no longer divine he turned to his wife and said do i look any different <laughs> <laughs> but, but what rh blies uh, in his studies of, of haiku and uh, rango and so on uh, he he uh, he his uh driving idea was that that the principles of Zen literature are universal, are in all literatures, and that the idea of satori is a passivity, that uh, a positive passivity that comes through, uh, where you're talking about nothingness, yeah. I was curious about, yeah. uh, is that in a similar vein? Is that possible? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can jump in with it. So we have David. And uh, we have uh, okay, uh, sorry, Joy. Joy and uh, John and uh, Seth. Seth. To keep your questions as short as possible and keep your answers as short as possible, so we have a productive round of discussion. Um, so, it's fascinating to tell. Um, the question I have for you was whether you thought this. Um, so, so the, I'm interested in this debate about Okinawa, right? And, and how the sovereignty issue uh, is kind of complicated by what Warren was saying. Because 
you're sort of indicating that there's a kind of almost giving up of sovereignty by on, on, on part of the Japanese people, in a sense, right? But then you're finding about sort of this conflict about sovereignty between Japan and Okinawa, but where it seemed like the point of contention was really the American base, right? Was, was mm -hmm. it like a lot of it was like, well, why do we have to deal with this base? And if we had sovereignty, we could kick them out maybe, or something like that. We had we, we as sort of democratically, we could like make some decisions about that. But it seems like overall that it's a sort of issue. Nobody wants to kind of make the sacrifices um, to you know to to deal with national security, which is being guaranteed by the United States in in a sense. The the sovereignty that we're talking about is one which um, you know if, if if we remember Paul Kahn's lecture, you know there's an indication that there's a notion of sacrifice that has to go along with sovereignty, and here there's there's a, almost a sense in which that um, concept of sacrifice is kind of disappeared, right? That there's no, there's no sense of, well, we're supposed to sacrifice for our national defense because we're, we're not allowed to do national defense and it, we've just kind of, we, we've, you know, we've offloaded into the United States and so, and, and so that there's, a, there's a whole different notion of what it means, what sovereignty then means because then, then you get this idea of the human rights equal sovereignty where in which you're, you're, you're kind of indicating that there is this sort of non-sacrificial notion of sovereignty in which you kind of dis dissolve it into a general human right so that who's, who's, you know, if all sovereignty is a sort of indication of our sacrifice for some ideal, which would be the nation typically, but here you can't do that to the nation, then you're doing it to the human, to the human rights, and, and then there's there's a kind of dissolution of the whole idea of, of sacrifice perhaps. But, I don't know, I'm just kind of trying to think <coughs> through based on, you know, the different presentations. But right after the United States, I thought you usually thought of the um, share of divided sovereignties, right? We can uh, divide Japan into four different states, and uh, each state has its own constitution, right? So, but, yeah, this, this was just, uh, you know, <coughs> Trial of thinking of time. But Ochinama's program the, uh, does not necessarily you know, derive from the uh, US base program. No. Uh, Okinawa has its own you know, unique history, right? And uh, <coughs> by referring to their own history, they are thinking, oh, if if mainland Japan abandons the uh, idea of the peace uh, constitution, well, we can make another state or another you know, republican society yeah, in Okinawa. So that's, that's not just a uh, no. But what does it mean to have a peace constitution in Okinawa when they put one of the hugest bases, hugest bases in the world? <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> yeah. In reality, they are trying to Eliminate our uh, US uh, NATO bases for it, but not sure, not sure. But uh, you know, in, in reality, it's really, really hard <coughs> for the uh, main Japanese uh, politicians, right? But even the uh, scholars relying on the constitutionalism cannot uh, face this problem. So that's why maybe we are now facing. New dimension of democracy. Right? That's my observation. Yes, um, one of the huge differences or changes from the Meiji Constitution, the points of contention to the Peace Constitution, was in, in the Meiji Constitution it provided for human rights, but there was this corollary or qualification is that you have the people have human rights as long as it does not. Uh, interfere with the law or as far as it is not uh, as prescribed by law. So the U.S. The GS wanted to get rid of that completely because the uh, the old guard said, "Well, this, there's not, there's no, you know, we have human rights already." There's just, you know, but the, but MacArthur said precisely that's the point that was abused by the governing people that they suppressed the people with that clause. 
So uh, Prime Minister Nakasone said, uh, when we, you know, as this peace article was developed, that oh, the U, uh, Japan is now there's kind of an exchange going on. Uh, a space of peace is created in order to make a space for war. So uh, Japan is like the it becomes an unsinkable aircraft carrier for the United <laughs> States <laughs> and uh, Okinawa even more so because you think the history of uh, this is something I wanted to ask you about too you know the um, relationship between mainland and, and Japan uh, mainland Japan and Okinawa has always been one of tension and uh, you know the, the sense that the, uh, there's some sense I think that uh, in the final battles of World War II and so on the Okinawans were Maybe used this for the cannon fodder. They were sac they were they did make a sacrifice, huge sacrifice. So uh, now this is repeated in in order for Japan to be peace, a place of peace, mainland Japan, this outlying territory right, is a place of war. Uh, in on the interest of sitting time, could, could I ask you to uh, uh, to just to, 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 to yeah, oh, oh, very quick question, cyber war. Uh, in the consciousness, it's a clean war, uh, disabling satellites. I mean, not just bots, so we were familiar with that. But uh, I'm just wondering if, uh, again, uh, that has uh, emerged as a possibility um, in, in, in the Japanese consciousness uh, of, of the global side. I was going to say that let's collect all the questions okay. and ask the panel to address all of them. Right. I mean, the second question, I think, was uh, John. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to direct one question to uh, Wang Xing. Uh, you, you said that uh, um, you should be uh, stated that um, to think constitutionally is unnatural for it's a sort of unnatural thing for a human being, right? I mean, that sort of makes a lot of sense. I mean, in some ways, you uh, when when a private person begins to think sort of constitutionally, he transforms himself into this abstract um, uh, sort of subject of the state rather than a you know, private person. But when he also says that uh, Europe sees its own triumphant image in Asia, right? Does Japan, uh, what does Japan do? In, in some ways, I, I, I wonder if this sort of Hegelian logic <laughs> is also you know, being applied to Japan itself. Does Japan also see its own triumphant image in China? Or is there also room for Japan to, uh, uh, to, to you know, uh, the, 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 the matter of fact is actually, this is both a moment of self belittling, belittling and also belittling and also self self aggrandizement because Europe definitely does not just see its triumphant image in you in Asia. It also sees its own triumphant image in India, in you know Africa, in all, all those other places, right? So 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 is that also uh, somehow um, you know uh, uh, in the end is you know, which, uh, 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 no, is you know technically you should be. The whole thing is it a, 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 a sort of a performance act? Is it sort of a put like a literary metaphor, or, or there's a real yeah, some kind of a, a constitutional thinking? I'll only look briefly at sort of the way that the constitutional project in Japan post-war was an effort to reform or educate uh, the self-image of the Japanese people, and especially these posters at the very end really brought that home. How successful, or what were the greatest challenges that, Jap uh, that Japanese educational institutions faced, mm. like teaching about the new constitution, mm. uh, adapting the consciousness of both educators and the educated to that new constitution? It's just it's an area that you all three suggested in some way, but we didn't get into it, so I'd love a little bit about it. Yes, I have a very silly question. Has anybody ever written a poem about sovereignty in Japan? <laughs> yeah, this is a, I guess this is one. Uh, I was thinking of Germany after the Second World War, I know Russ man, mentioned the first, where there was opposition to the US, uh, well, allied, but mostly US imposed structure in many ways. Um, and there was a generational effect. After 20 or so years, there was a rep repudiation of the generation of World War II, and um, now there's a critique of the repudiation, right? So you, we have three or so. And I was wondering if you could speak briefly to generational effects in Japan. In five minutes. <laughs> so, uh, at least five minutes, let's keep in mind our, our eating into our coffee break. <laughs> okay, I'll be as concise as humanly possible. I wonder if I feel to assume me, uh, the answer will be as follows quote unquote, Japan is nothing. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I can explore. Uh, I can elaborate it on on, on it in the <laughs> other version. <laughs> oh, so, so uh, about the cyber war, I'm not so sure. But if, considering all the deployments and actions of the the SDF, the Self Defense Force, from even before it was called the Self Defense Force, and it was just like the police force. Uh, they sent minesweepers to Korea, to Incheon Harbor. They uh, sent uh, uh, medical uh, support to the Gulf, Persian Gulf. Uh, any of number of these things. Apparently, they never killed anyone. <laughs> no one has died at the hands of a member of these forces. Uh, and then as far as the poem, Japanese people write poems about everything. So. <laughs> uh, and about Germany, oh, the, the, the question about the generational thing. Uh, I, one of the informants, I asked, um, the informant mentioned something about, or I asked about the young, young people. It somehow came up in the discussion. And what I remember they reported was that they went to their favorite cafe that posted all these signs that said war is over or no more war is ended or something like that. But then it was uh, people vandalized it. And they, she said, the person said, sorry, I gave away gender, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, that the, these young people seem to have never heard of John and Yoko. Uh -huh. and, uh, um, and then it also gave examples about the hip hop culture is now very disturbing violent militant and, and all kinds of celebrations of like extreme kamikaze activity in uh, moe, manga, things like that. So uh, indi indicated that there is a, a great generational, there, there's this back uh, swing that you refer to. Teaching about new constitution. <clears throat> the Ministry of Education uh, refused the uh, book entitled um, Story About New Constitution. Right? But it, it, it was a really nice you know, <coughs> Alex proclamation of New Constitution in the 1990s. Right? Yeah, at the moment, a bunch of uh, poems, novels uh, of, of celebrity uh, also you know, distributed. But after that, you know, for example, in middle school, high school, the teaching of the Constitution or about the Constitution is somehow restricted. Right? So we have now such a you know, air <laughs> cookie right, in education system. But uh, thanks to Prime Minister Pape, now we, <coughs> we have a very uh, active debates on the Constitution. Normally, our uh, atmosphere will be more shifted. Well, since uh, we have one minute of time, I can resist, but I wanted to add a, a, a perspective. I think that the elephant in the room here is something Carl Schmidt observed in his writings on war. That the international law or international order is first and foremost about deciding on war and peace. In other words, Japanese constitution, looking from inside, <laughs> and all that, you know, all these kind of complicated uh, movements and laws, ambiguity, but from outside, it's really about American so it's military supremacy at the second world war. It's the Yalta system, international order, uh, this can be good, however experienced internally by the Japanese people from outside, for instance, China, Korea, they would want to play along. Let's just pretend this is normalcy, right? Because as long as this post Second World War order is in place, we, we don't have to worry about the remilitarization of Japan and so on and so forth. So I guess that it reflects fundamentally this. Mm -hmm. The last war as a, as a consequence is coming to the order. So, Japanese constitution, I guess, it, in itself is a product of international law. Yeah. Right? As, mm -hmm. as much as it's the, the, the internal 
the considerations. Yeah, that, that's why now <coughs> there is a very new trend to think of possibility of, for example, East Asian constitution. Right? So it's a new type of international of constitution, of uh, Japanese constitution. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know <coughs> what direction it goes in the future. But it's a lot. Thank you. So let's thank the panel. Yeah.